Before we start, just can you give mm -hmm. me a little background of what interests you about this work? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and what do you what is, what is your field? So I'm in neuroscience, um, but I came to I initially studied psychology as an undergraduate, and then you know, specialized more and more in, in the kind of brain side of things. But my initial um, interest in this stuff came from as a teenager having kind of I was raised Catholic, but then I had a kind of it was actually when I was wrestling with a crisis of faith. Um, I was I couldn't get over the uh, the level of metaphysical threat that there was around around kind of original sin and um, uh, the, the prospect of hell. And I, I was about 13 years old and it was really, really I was overly conscientious as a, as a child and it was really bothering me. And it effectively the way I think about it now is it effectively kind of baffled my rational mind, like in um, Zen Buddhism, where they have these koans, these paradoxes that are intended to, to, you know, disrupt the rational mind. And I had this amazing experience of just utter serenity and a complete, it was just the most profound experience of my life. And it just came from having this kind of silent mind experience. Um, and from that moment on, I was, I was very interested in, in the mind, but also in kind of spiritual experience and, I tended, I've tended to go down the route of understanding it naturalistically through science. Um, and, but yeah, so I'm very interested in mysticism of all religious kind of types. And so I've interviewed a kind of experts on, on Buddhism and I've spoken to a few people on Christianity um, and an amazing rabbi on um, Jewish mysticism. So yeah, I'm, I'm kind of exploring myself because I'm, I'm not a religious scholar, but. Well, that's very interesting. I thought of studying neuroscience in college too, oh, really? but at that point, it was at, it was at such a different level. It was you know right. how the brain perceives red and green, and I thought, no, this is too <laughs> slow. I mean, now neuroscience is very much more interesting, and cognitive psychology, which fascinates me too. But I thought studying the traditions themselves would be illuminating in different ways. So that's that's what I did. But you could. If you saw the latest book, Why Religion, I forget whether you mentioned it. It does talk about that, but also, um, and that I'm sure we'll talk about this, religion as experience, as the kind of experience you had. Right, Not exactly. as a, a set of cognitive beliefs. Yeah, that was the um, <clears throat> the thing that was liberating. I mean, in in that experience, I was I was immediately released from all concerns around dogma. I suddenly felt that there were deep kind of experiential spiritual truths that you can discover yourself, but I didn't need to worry about other people telling me scary stories, really. It was suddenly, it was just like, okay, these are just things people are telling me. These are words, these are ideas, but the real, the real yes. thing is, is yes. something you discover yourself. That's not really, it's kind of beyond words and ideas, I would say. Exactly. And as you see, when I discovered the gospel of Thomas, I said, Okay, this makes sense to me, not the other. Right. So maybe we can begin with a bit of your your background, how you became interested in Christianity in the first place. Well, like many people these days, I was brought up in a secular family. It was nominally Christian, but my father had given up the kind of ferocious Presbyterianism of his family for Darwin as soon as he encountered science. And he said, well, obviously these stories are just silly old folk tales. Who needs that? Only ignorant people would be religious. So he, he just dismissed the whole thing as something that only uneducated people would have any interest in. And, and yet I love poetry and music and dance and all kinds of um, creative expressions that are very traditionally grew out of, out of religious traditions, ancient ones, native ones, you know, Christian, Jewish, all of them, Muslim, uh, grew, you know, they developed a great deal of poetry and music and ritual and all of the forms of imaginative exploration. So I love those, but I never knew until I was 14, I, I wrote about this, that. I was living in what I thought was a very boring town, Palo Alto in California, where Stanford University is. My father was on the faculty doing biology. And somebody said, let's go to San Francisco. 
well, I thought anything in San Francisco would be more interesting than Palo Alto on a sleepy Sunday afternoon. So I went. What I didn't know, James, is that we were going to a Billy Graham crusade, a <laughs> crusade for Christ. And that was alien to my background. But there in the sports stadium where I'd seen baseball games played, enormous, like 20,000 people, they were there to see this preacher. And he spoke very powerfully uh, in many ways. And I was very moved by the music and the power of the speech and, uh, and what he said. And so when the altar call came, I just thought, yes, I'm going down. I'm going to be born again. At 14, that seemed an irresistible invitation to start all over and have a different life. Right? And so I did. And I joined an evangelical church. For about a year, I was intensely involved, and then I had to leave that church. That I wonder if that's a um, an interesting form of rebellion. If you have parents who are who are secular, do you think that was part of it? I do think that was part of it. All the the other side of it is that you know a, a world in which rationalism is is the highest form of understanding felt kind of like a flat earth. It, it, it's, there wasn't another dimension, which I didn't know how to articulate. I wouldn't have known what a spiritual dimension was then. But, but that preaching opened up something that I felt was very powerful, which has to do with the imagination and has to do with the way we understand ourselves, you know, in terms of poetry or visions or whatever. Yeah, I think I like that, um, the way you so, put that. And I, I tend to think of science as kind of a map, you know, but, but lived experience is the territory. Um, so, so science and rationalism by itself is a bit dry. Um, but the real, the real stuff is, can be discovered through spiritual experience. So yeah, I like the way you put that. Well, I like the way Einstein put it. He said, you really need both. And, mm -hmm. you know, later I married a theoretical physicist, a wonderful person. Um, who said to me initially, why religion? I mean, why don't you do something with impact in the real world? <laughs> so, why do you study elementary particles? You know? I mean, what, they're invisible, you can't see them? I mean, what difference does it make? And we both realized we were interested in finding out something fundamental about, about the world we live in. And he came to enjoy the fact that I was studying religion, thinking about it, not just sort of caught in it as a kind of preacher, but I went to a secular university on purpose so that um, so that I could ask the questions I needed to ask. Right. And was was it when you were a teenager and you wrote about a um, a car crash in which a friend died that was kind of pivotal for your relationship with this evangelical church? Yes, it was. I mean, that's how I suddenly was precipitated out of that church as, as suddenly as I'd been precipitated into it. Um, it was an, an accident following a party in Palo Alto in which people were driving too fast. And one of my closest friends who was 16 years old was, was crushed when the car turned over. And in it, there were two other friends of ours. One was a musician, Jerry Garcia, and another was his close friend, Alan Trist, who was actually on a gap year from Westminster School right before he would go back to Cambridge University. And he had oddly become a friend of Jerry Garcia, who was a Latino street kid, sort of just out of the army, with a great gift for music. And they became very unlikely buddies and traveled around together and enjoyed each other. And so then I went back to my evangelical church brokenhearted because our friend had, had been killed in the crash, a very extraordinary person. And, and my evangelical friend said, that's terrible. You know, was he born again? And I said, no, he was Jewish. And they said, well, then he's in hell. And I felt like I had been sort of socked in the stomach. And I, I thought, well, wasn't Jesus Jewish? What are you talking about? This was supposed to be about God's love. It has nothing to do with what you just said. So I just walked out of there and felt utterly desolate. I never went back. And it was years before I ever approached 
Christianity again. But when I did, it was not looking for faith. I was trying to say, what hit me then? What was it about those traditions that seemed to open up a dimension of experience that I hadn't even known existed? How did it start? How did the story of Jesus give birth to these institutions, which claimed to know everything about him and claimed to offer the, the only route to salvation, whatever they mean by that? So I wanted to understand the history. Like you, I wanted to take a secular approach and did. Right. Behind it, there was, there was a spiritual quest involved, but I wasn't going to take that route. And is it right that that car crash is where the band The Grateful Dead get their name from? Yes. In fact, I was talking to someone, to Terry Gross, on her program in the States called Fresh Air about the crash. And I, I said that five years after the accident, Jerry Garcia started a band. I was in graduate school by then, but he started this band and he called it The Grateful Dead. And I thought, oh, that must be because he and Alan nearly got killed. And then somebody called up Alan Trist. By that time, Jerry had died. That was just a couple of years ago. And called up Alan Trist and said, some woman on the on radio was talking about how the band got their name. But that's not what happened. We know the story. And he said, you don't know the story. Because it really was about the car crash. Jerry had said that was something that transformed his life made him serious about his music. And after that, Alan Trist went back from Cambridge University studying anthropology to become the music publisher for The Grateful Dead for the next 35 years.